welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute to this program on the future of natural law. Um, if you're not already familiar with the Lumen Christi Institute, we're a Catholic educational nonprofit located here next to the University of Chicago, whose mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition in its depth and breadth a vital part of the University of Chicago and the wider academy through non-credit courses, master classes, conferences, lectures, and summer seminars. Um, before turning to our program today, I just want to call your attention to uh, an upcoming set of events next week. Um, next week, the Lumen Christi Institute is sponsoring a program organized here by the Martin Marty Center and the Divinity School in honor of Jean-Luc Marion, who is retiring after 26 years um, here at the University of Chicago. Um, you can find more details on our website or at the Divinity Schools page, um, but it's uh, wonderful within these two weeks um, to celebrate the careers of two um, wonderful scholars who have been instrumental uh, in our work here at the University of Chicago. Um, I also want to extend a special welcome uh, here to those in the room, to the scholars who are participating in a multi-day working conference, Society, Law, and Virtue Colloquium in honor of Russell Hittinger. Um, Russ has not only been a regular partner speaking here on campus over the past 23 years or so, um, but he's also been instrumental in our summer seminar program, forming students in Catholic social thought, Aquinas and natural law, Aquinas on natural law, and Augustine City of God um, for the past 11 years. Um, I was privileged to take part in several of these seminars and can attest that uh, his seminar was instrumental not only to my understanding of Catholic social thought, um, but it also directly shaped the course of my dissertation research. Uh, so it's an honor then really to welcome you here, Russ, uh, and uh, it's really just, I can speak on behalf of all of the students who participated in your programs. Thank you for your excellent pedagogy, um, and thank you for helping set the topic, certainly for today's conversation. Um, this conversation picks up a central theme in Russ's work, um, but looks forward with this program on the future of natural law. Uh, moderating this conversation and introducing our additional discussants is Professor Scott Roniger, a longtime friend of the Institute and friend to myself. And in addition to holding that highest title, a friend. Uh, Scott is also Associate Professor of Philosophy at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where he currently holds the Father Robert H. Taylor Chair in Philosophy and directs the Lonergan Center for Catholic Faith and Culture. Uh, in addition to the many places where he earned degrees, uh, he is an alumnus of this institution, having d received a master's here in philosophy from the University of Chicago. Um, he later went on to receive a doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of America. He's published scholarly articles on metaphysics, Catholic social teaching, phenomenology, ethics and political philosophy, and philosophy and literature, and is currently editing a collection of essays by Russell Hittinger on natural law and Catholic social teaching. Scott also most recently co-taught our summer seminar on Catholic social thought in Berkeley uh, with Russ Hittinger. Uh, so please join me in welcoming to the stage, Scott Roniger. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's, uh, it's always a, a joy to be back in Chicago and doing things for Lumen Christi. I want to say a special thank you to not only to Michael, but to the Institute as a whole and to its new director. Uh, I want to say a special thank you as well to, to Rick Huff, an old student of Russ's, who's, who's really made this possible in, in a real way. Uh, and so I have the, the honor of introducing our two very distinguished panelists here. Uh, but before I do so, I just want to say a word about the structure of the event. It's going to be a real conversation. And so we have not asked them to prepare a kind of a, an academic paper. Uh, it's going to be more of a living dialogue. Uh, and at the end, we'll take questions. Um, so first, we have uh, John R. Bolin. Uh, is the Robert L. Stewart Professor of Philosophy and Christian Ethics at Princeton Theological Seminary. He earned his MDiv from Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York and his MA and PhD from Princeton University. He's a member of the American Academy of Religion, the Society of Christian Ethics, and the Society for Values in Higher Education, and has served on the editorial board of the Journal of Religious Ethics since 2003. His areas of specialization are Christian ethics, moral philosophy, social ethics and criticism, 
in the history of moral theology, and his courses cover ethics and the problem of evil, ethics and politics in Augustine, war and Christian conscience, and friendship, love, and justice. He is a member of the Presbyterian Church, USA. Father Kevin Flannery, our other panelist, uh, SJ, is ordinary professor of the history of ancient philosophy at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, where he previously served as dean of the philosophy faculty. Father Flannery is the author of many works on ethics and on the history of logic, including Acts Amid Precepts, the Aristotelian logical structure of Thomas Aquinas' moral theory. He received his DPhil from the University of Oxford. Okay, so I am actually going to pose the initial question uh, for our conversation, and then we'll, our, our panelists will take turns discussing it, and then we'll move on from there. As Michael mentioned, this, um, this conversation is really a part of a colloquium in which we're honoring uh, Russell Hittinger's, I would say, historically important work on Catholic social teaching and natural law. And um, I think it's a fitting way to begin this conversation uh, by using Russ's work as a kind of springboard to pose the initial question, which is what I'll do. Uh, so Hittinger, and a reflection on, on Ratzinger's thought actually on natural law, distinguishes three contexts in which the natural law is employed. First, the systematic context. Second, the dialectical context. And third, the dialogical. Hittinger says that natural law thinking within the systematic context is, quote, not immediately concerned with making moral arguments, but rather with making coherent the sources of truth, including what is recognized or presupposed about the natural habitat of reason, unquote. The systematic context is the most comprehensive and contemplative of the three. Natural law thinking within this context is concerned with identifying and integrating the sources of knowledge of the natural law. Within the dialectical context, philosophers, theologians, begin with a concrete disputed moral question, which is usually occasioned by current cases or more dilemmas, and accept an attempt to reason to a specific conclusion. Thus, natural law thinking within the dialectical context seeks to answer a pressing moral question by applying the natural law to a concrete case. Finally, third, philosophers and theologians operating in the dialogical context do not search primarily for answers to specific moral questions or for the systematic coherence of the sources of truth. Rather, they use the natural law as an aspect of the search for common premises across religious and philosophical traditions. Hittinger says that natural law thinking in the dialogical context is, quote, a search for common and converging pathways of evidence, unquote. All three contexts are intertwined, so a development in one area has consequences for the other two. However, each of these three contexts for reflection on the natural law has its own integrity and proper method of investigation. So with this as a springboard from, from Russ's own work on natural law, I will pose the initial question and then we'll have two responses. Um, what do you see as the major issue for the future of natural law thinking in each of these three areas, or each of these three contexts. And John, you'll, you'll go first, talk about all three, and I think Father Kevin, uh, Father Flannery will concentrate on uh, the dialectical context. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It's an honor to be here, to be with you all. It's um, a deep pleasure and honor to be at an event in honor of my friend, Russell Hittinger. Um, I can't tell you how important he has been in my life as a friend and a colleague. Um, there's lots to say about that, but I'd probably cry, so I'm not gonna say it. So my task, as I understand it, is, is not simply to address Scott's question, but to do so in a way that says something about recent Protestant engagements with the natural law traditions. I, I am a Protestant, I do teach at a Protestant seminary, Believe it or not, Protestants do actually, from time to time, engage Thomas in the natural law. I'm gonna give you three examples of that that track more or less Russ's um, three-part typology. But I can't speak of those recent Protestant engagements without mentioning Victor Preller, philosopher, priest, and author of Divine Science and the Science of God, his 1967 reformulation of Thomas's treatment of, uh, his reformulation of Thomas via Sellers. If you don't know Wil Wilfred Sellers, you'll find that book puzzling. 
But for 35 years, Vic taught Thomas to Princeton University students, most of them Protestants. And it was in a seminar on natural law that he offered in the spring semester of 1988 where I first encountered Russell Hittinger. We had spent a week reading the new natural lawyers, Finnis, Grise, and Boyle. And Vic invited Russ down from Fordham to discuss his recently published critique. I think the seminar that Russ visit visited was in April. The critique came out in January, I think. To make things interesting, Vic also invited a recently appointed assistant professor from the politics department, Robbie George. It was an exciting afternoon with these three different treatments of Thomas and the natural law on offer, and the setting was perfect, kind of like this. There was wood panel on the walls. There was a, a large wood table we sat around. At one end was a large fireplace. On either side of the fireplace, there was a pillar with Aquinas atop of, a statue of Aquinas on top of one pillar. On the other, a statue of Aristotle. In between was a gigantic wood frieze that depicted Wittgenstein's muse, the goddess grammar on her goat, <laughs> cracking her whip. I can't think of Russ or remember his friend, my teacher, Victor Preller, without recalling that scene, that exciting afternoon. And as I said, I can't tell the tale of recent Protestant work on Thomas and the natural law without acknowledging Vic's important influence on the story. It was Preller who in the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s who encouraged Protestant scholars of religion, ethics, and politics to learn from Thomas and make use of him in their own efforts. I want to offer three examples of those efforts, three examples of recent Protestant engagements with the traditions of the natural law and the work of St. Thomas. The first two map more or less onto the first two contexts that Russ identifies, the systematic and the dialectical. And they are perhaps the two most prominent ways in which recent Protestant theologians, moralists, and philosophers have made use of the natural law traditions. The third corresponds to Russ's third context, the dialogical, and it is less common and less well understood than the other two, even if its paradigmatic example in Dr. King's famous remarks from his letter from Birmingham is, is famous, more well known. I'll discuss the first two briefly and then consider at greater length the third. My aim will be to spell out the purposes and warrants of this third Protestant use of the natural law traditions. So let's call the first dogmatic. Here I refer to those Protestant theologians who use Thomas's remarks on the natural law in order to say how rational creatures participate in God's eternal law and thus fall under divine jurisdiction. Reformed Protestants in particular, those who trace their lineage to uh, Calvin's Geneva, reformed Protestants in particular have come to realize how Thomas's remarks can be used to develop an account of divine sovereignty of God's lordship over all creation, and above all, an account of God's rule over the sources of human knowledge and action over our intellects and will. Two recent examples of this dogmatic use of the natural law traditions are worth mentioning. The first is Jeffrey Scaff's Routledge 2021 book, Thomas Aquinas and Karl Barth, A New Conversation. A second is an older book, a, a Notre Dame 1995 book by Gene Rogers, Thomas Aquinas and Karl Barth, Sacred Doctrine and the Natural Knowledge of God. As you can tell from the titles, both Scaff and Rogers work against the backdrop of Karl Barth's, that's the Swiss theologian from the 20th century, Karl Barth's refusal to countenance any talk of the human creature's natural knowledge of God or the human will's natural orientation to a transcendent good. And both quiet these Barthian anxieties by identifying the important role the natural law plays in the drama of salvation that Thomas recounts, where the old law not only includes the natural law's moral precepts, but also, and importantly, prepares Israel for Christ. And where the new law of the gospel not only fulfills the old, but also, and importantly, arrives as God's saving mercy and justice. This is an Aquinas that even a Bartian could love. 
The second use is less concerned with dogmatic inquiries and more concerned with moral matters. Here the natural law is regarded as a collection of absolute moral demands and prohibitions that bind all persons everywhere and always, and that can be appealed to in contemporary debates about the just and the unjust. Here the accent is on reasoning from general uh, precepts known naturally to concrete actions. And here I want to lift up two quite different examples of this second use. The first can be found among contemporary neo-Calvinists. Most of these are followers of the early 20th century Dutch pastor, statesman, and theologian Abraham Kuyper. For these Kuyperians, the moral precepts that belong to created human nature are aspects of what they call the covenant of works that God made with Adam, a covenant that Adam violated, that still binds Adam's sinful progeny, and that justifies God's wrathful punishment of those who are not elected to membership in Christ's covenant of grace. David Van Drunen, his uh, 2014 book, Divine Covenants and Moral Order, A Biblical Theology of Natural Law, is an excellent example of this second Protestant use. A second example of this second Protestant use comes in Vincent Lloyd's recent book, Black Natural Law, 2016, Oxford Press. Lloyd contends that there is a black natural law tradition in America that has largely gone unnoticed and that has nevertheless provided a robust resource for black political life and engagement from slavery and reconstruction through Jim Crow and the civil rights movement. Frederick Douglass, Anna Julia Cooper, W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King Jr. are the leading lights of this tradition. And by Lloyd's lights, each of them look to human nature and its practical implications in order to offer judgments on the moral and political issues of the day. Lloyd suggests that the pragmatist turn in recent African-American political thought would do well to recall this natural law tradition. Which brings me to the third example of recent Protestant engagements with the tradition of natural law. Here the natural law is referred to as the reality and ideal of practical truth, nothing more. And here the best example of this variety is, as I said, Dr. King's famous remarks in his letter from the Birmingham jail, where he refers to the natural law in order to distinguish just and unjust positive laws. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God, says Dr. King. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in the eternal or natural law. His examples of injustice were close at hand, the conditions of legally enforced racist domination and segregation that he and others were contesting. There were laws that forced black Americans to suffer undue losses to their persons, property, and dignity, while enabling their white fellow citizens to use the public offices of the state to secure private gain. There were other laws that imposed burdens on a minority without their consent and that guaranteed unchecked, unchecked power to a majority. And there were otherwise just laws applied unjustly with the aim of bringing benefit to some and doing undue harm to others. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up the segregation laws, was democratically elected, asks King. Throughout the state of Alabama, all types of conniving methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? As I said, these are familiar and justly famous uh, remarks about, on the natural law. Timely, too, I think. Russ says that these three modes of natural law thought are entangled, and so they are, but they are also distinct. And this third use, this third one on Dr. King's rendering, bears witness to recent Protestant willingness to do social criticism and name social ills without referring to or expressing interest in a metaphysical ground. There's lots to say about the sources of this willingness. In some cases, it come, in, in certain quarters, certain Bartian quarters, it comes as a settled hostility to all metaphysics. In other quarters, call them Salarzian, it comes as a suspicion of metaphysical posits that arrive as givens. In Dr. King's case, it arrives via his democratic commitments. In his letter, he expresses confidence that his fellow citizens share a collection of proximate ends, 
above all the desire to set right their various social and political relationships. And he assumes they agree in broad outline about the character of a just relationship. At the very least, he doubts that anyone will call a relationship just that includes domination, where one party is at the mercy of another, left helpless before arbitrary power and made easy for exploitation. Domination and exploitation are paradigmatic examples of injustice. Dr. King addresses his letter to white pastors who acknowledge those basic moral truths and express a vague commitment to opposing these forms of injustice while turning a blind eye to Jim Crow's concrete examples. So King engages in imminent criticism. He, he, their lives, he tells these white pastors, do not embody their basic moral convictions. Indeed, their refusal to oppose unjust positive laws and racist social mores casts doubt on their commitment to these convictions. When he speaks of the natural law, the point is to mark this distinction between conviction and convention and to locate it among his own theological commitments. There are moral truths that transcend local sinful convention. These belong to God's eternal law. The injustice of legally enforced domination and exploitation is one such example. The natural law for King does not tell us that domination and exploitation are unjust. Rather, their injustice reminds us that there are moral truths that rule and measure positive law. Dr. King speaks of the natural law in order to bear witness to this fact, nothing more. Jim Crow America offered untold examples of social and political relationships distorted by domination and exploitation. Later in his life, Dr. King referred to others, to economic exploitation at home and colonial domination abroad. In our own day, we might refer to sex trafficking, the unjust treatment of immigrants and refugees, judicial torture, militarized policing, and to new variations on an older Jim Crow. We might also refer to the fact that vast differentials of power, wealth, and social position have left far too many of our fellow citizens subject to the unaccountable power of others. These contemporary examples of domination and exploitation are among the gravest injustices, or so I think. And note, justifying this thought, vindicating this moral truth, involves nothing more than showing how these examples exhibit these features because, of course, everyone thinks that domination and exploitation are horrifically bad, even if they quarrel about concrete cases, even if they disagree about the metaphysics of morals, about whatever it is that grounds this badness. Following Dr. King, we might say that justifying a moral claim is one thing, that grounding a moral claim in something other than itself is quite another, and that quite often the question of metaphysical dependence need not be resolved in advance of successful justification. When Dr. King speaks of the natural law, he names the moral truths that we can and should endorse. He offers reasons that encourage his fellow citizens to share that endorsement. And he implicitly draws precisely this distinction between the justifying warrants that he does provide and the metaphysical grounds that he does not. King's resistance to metaphysics, I want to emphasize, is not principled. It's not Barthian. He's not against it, but practical and democratic. Dialogical agreement on basic moral truths is what he's after. Too much attention to contested, disputed, uncertain metaphysical grounds, he thinks, will only get in the way of this hope. Sustaining hope for dialogical agreement, this is what he's after. This is no small thing. This is the source of his resistance. Good evening, I'm, I'm very glad to be here, and especially at this event in, in honor of, of Russ Hittinger. Uh, we're friends from, for longer than I, we both care to even think about, so, it, but, uh, um, so thank you very much you know, for, for having me here. Um, as is, has been you know, already in, indicated, what I'll be speaking of uh, briefly is uh, the 
context which uh, Russ has identified as dialectical. And, uh, and it's uh, what I'll be saying has to do with a particular principle which is often used in order to look at particular um, dialectical pro pro problems. And, and in fact, it should be fairly obvious, you know, the sort of problems that this uh, uh, principle could be used to uh, uh, resolve. And uh, I might also add that, that I, I do think that um, understanding this particular principle, which comes from Thomas Aquinas, but relying uh, on Aristotle and also on Plato, uh, that is understanding that particular uh, precept or um, um, argument, uh, uh, if we don't understand it well, that the future of natural law is threatened. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, to repeat, um, when we're talking in this particular context that is of the dialectical, we are talking about something very much more particular than what's already been, been discussed. So in, in uh, Dr. Hissinger's uh, wonderfully pivotal essay, that is Natural Law and Public Discourse, uh, the d Legacies of Joseph Ratzinger, that's where these uh, three contexts are identified, mentioned a number of times is a document by the International Theological Commission, which is a commission which falls under the uh, uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or sometimes known as the Holy Office, now known as the Dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith uh, at the Vatican. And, uh, um, and so it was a, a, a commission um, very much set up by uh, the then Cardinal Ratzinger in order to look at um, uh, in specifically the natural law. And as um, uh, Russell has been explaining to us uh, these last couple of days and also in our reading of the, of the papers for, for this uh, gathering, it was only once Cardinal Ratzinger became, became prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that he, he began to look at these issues. And so, so he, he deputed you know, a group of scholars to look pre precisely at uh, natural law and they came up with, uh, um, with a, a document which, uh, the title of which I think I have it written down here. Um, in fact, I hadn't written, but, but it, it has, no, no, in fact, the, the title of the, of the document that the International Theo Theological Commission came up with is The Search for Universal Ethics, A New Look at Natural Law. And this, uh, top, this particular topic was given to the, uh, the commission in 2004. That is while uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was still prefect but it was uh, developed over about a year and was published in, in 2005. As uh, Dr. Hittinger, Hittinger explains, the International the Theological Commit Commission wanted to confront a number, number of problems in the Catholic natural law tradition. For instance, and I quote, uh, suggesting uh, that the precepts of natural law are an already assembled system even down to the most proximate level of precepts governing a particular case. So that's uh, one of the um, things that they wanted to look at. And, and an example uh, would be that is uh, suggesting that the precepts of natural law are, a, um, are an already assembled system, even, uh, even down to the proximate level of precepts governing particular cases. The, the, um, one of the uh, passages in Thomas Aquinas cited by this document is, is a very important uh, article in, in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, and that is it comes in the prima secundi, that is the first part of the second part, uh, question uh, 94 and article 4, if anyone's uh, interested in looking that up. And the, the crucial phrase in, in that particular article by St. Thomas is, is this, at least it's, it's, it appears in this way in, in one of the, in probably the standard uh, English translation. And it says that, um, and it says this, that, that although there is necessity in the general principles, that is g general principles of natural law or the moral law, the more we descend to matters of detail, 
the more frequently we encounter defects. And that's, uh, there's a very similar uh, uh, rendering of, of Thomas Aquinas's Latin in the French. And in fact, the document that the uh, commission came out with was uh, first composed in French. But it's very interesting, interesting to study the, um, the text that actually appears in the document because it, it quotes one of the, one of the or these standard uh, French texts of the Summa Theologiae, and yet at certain cr crucial points it, it, it changes the, uh, the translation. And basically what the issue here, and I'll, I'll read the, the phrase, uh, um, the Latin phrase, and, and it says, etsi in communibus sit aliqua necessitas, even though in common, something common, um, uh, there is necessity. Quantum magis ad propria descenditor, all the, when, when we go to the propria, your proper things, um, then you discover defects. That's the idea. And uh, interesting, very interestingly, and uh, important for, for current uh, Catholic uh, moral teaching, is that in uh, Pope Francis's uh, encyclical Amoris Laetitia, um, that very uh, passage in Thomas Aquinas is cited. And I'll read exactly what uh, appears in that encyclical. This is the phrase. It is true that general rules set forth a good which can never be disregarded or neglected. But in their formulation, that is of these general rules, they cannot provide absolutely for all partic particular situations. At the same time, it must be said that precisely for that reason, what is part of a practical discernment in particular circumstances cannot be elevated to the level of a rule. And then it continues, that would not only lead to an intolerable casuistry, that is, consideration of particular cases as in you know, a dialectical context, but would endanger the very values which must be preserved with special care. So that's the end of that uh, quotation. So um, basically, you know, a, a very, very common inter interpretation, obviously, you know, I've given you three uh, instances, a very common interpretation of 94.4, that is that, that passage is, maintains that the moment that we get to particular situations, that is in confronting a, a particular moral situation, uh, or, and to use the translation, which we've seen in the English translation, uh, matters of detail, no precepts of natural law is truly binding. And that's the um, general principle, that, uh, or at least that's the, a very common um, uh, uh, interpretation. And, uh, in other words, that the, the phrase uh, that's used in the Latin, conclusiones propriae, um, uh, uh, that actually refers simply to matters of detail, when you get down to detail. As a matter of fact, um, if you, uh, when, you, when you study what Thomas Aquinas actually says there in that, in that passage, and he, he cites a number of times uh, uh, Aristotle. And in fact, what Aristotle is doing there, and, and um, well, he cites uh, a work uh, of Aristotle's known as the Posterior Analytics in early in the first book, the 10th chapter, if someone's interested, in which, um, in which he makes a, a distinction between, between um, precepts or, or principles which are very common, and in fact common among all sciences, but then within individual sciences there will be proper principles or, or precepts. and, and uh, um, and so uh, we find very similar things sometimes with some variation also in, in Aristotle's uh, uh, physics. So he makes very, very similar arguments about, um, uh, about sciences, basically, the way we, that, that, that we can organize sciences. And, um, and uh, uh, in other words, uh, when the phrase is used in, in that crucial passage in the, in the Summa Theologiae that is talking about um, things which are proper, he's not talking about simply once we arrive at details, uh, 
that things get vague, but, he, but he's, he's, he's saying that, okay, you do actually arrive at, at laws or precepts, which are laws or precepts, but given certain circumstances, there may be cases in which they do not apply. And, uh, and, and Thomas himself uh, cites a passage with, or, or an example which uh, occurs in the, in the first book of Plato's Republic. And, uh, um, and strangely, it never actually appeared, at least that I've been able to find, in Aristotle himself. And uh, although there is, there is one passage which, which comes quite close to it. And, but, the, but the example that, uh, um, that uh, Plato gives in the Republic is that he says, he says well, you know, it's ab absolutely clear uh, that according to law that we are obliged, it is a law, that you must always return a deposit, you know, or uh, in, in a, a deposit would be something that is given to another person to hold with the agreement, with the knowledge, the agreement, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the precept in natural law. That, in fact, when, it's, when the, the person who owns it asks for it back, you will give it back. And so, and, and so Plato begins by saying that, that that is very clearly, you know, a, you know, a precept of the natural law, although, you know, it's somewhat lower than you know, the highest precepts. And, but then he uses the example, he says, well, well imagine that uh, there's someone, uh, someone gives to you a weapon. And we're talking about you know, kind of ancient Greece, so we're, we're, so we're probably talking, about, we're not talking about you know, uh, you know, an, an AR-15 or whatever, but you know, so, you know, a sword or something like that. But, um, uh, but anyhow, it, so Plato asks, okay, imagine that, or it's, let us suppose that you know, what is given to you as a deposit is an arm, and the person that comes returns uh, comes back to you asking for what he has left as a deposit. Uh, in fact, his his eyes are are, are darting back and forth, etc., and, and he's he's murmuring things about uh, Pericles or whomever. And and uh, so at that point, uh, uh, and um, Plato says, well, you simply you know it is simply it would be against the law to give that that deposit back to the, the person who who actually owns it. And uh, and there there are other other passages which or other examples that we could use. And uh, but um, the important thing to bear in mind here is that is that is that you know laws do find their way down into the details. And 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 so in detailed situations, particular situations, in fact, um, the the lower precepts usually do, in fact, bind, although they sometimes do not. And in, in fact, there's a, a passage which uh, a, a, a becomes part of the, of the tradition, is that, is that, is that what's, what's occurring when, when, a, um, when, a, when a common precept is not applied um, is that, that one, the one actually at the, the ground level um, and is being asked or is required to apply the law. In fact, what he must do is to apply the law as the legislator would have intended it to be applied. And uh, that is, in other words, following the, uh, in the so-called intention of the legislator. And, uh, and that's, um, uh, so in a, in a way, it's all, it, nor is it even kind of a, a denial of the application of the law to the particular case, but it's simply um, uh, a question of whether it is uh, in, would have been in the mind of the legislator to apply it. And in fact, it's often, again, in uh, Thomas, I think, I think Thomas, um, but anyhow, the, the idea is that were the legislator actually there, present, um, he would apply it in a certain way or not apply it in a certain way. Um, so I might just mention um, one other thing. There's, uh, for, for those of you that, who, um, have dedicated yourselves to studying Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. That at the very, towards the end of uh, the fifth book of the Nicomachean Ethics by by Aristotle, in fact, he he has a um, a chapter which is devoted to um, what's often translated as equity, or uh, it, it becomes in in uh, canon law epikeia, or in Greek epikeia, and uh, so. But it it it's not dissimilar to what we were talking about. So um, uh, that, it, you know, it has to do with uh, uh, the application of the law, but an application of the law um, according to equity, the equity which is perceived in a particular situation. 
But anyhow, my, my basic argument is the one that I mentioned at the very beginning, is that, uh, that I do think that it would be not at all good for the tradition of canon, canon law uh, to, interpret it, to interpret that, uh, that article, Prima Secunde 94.4, in a way that it uh, does not say. Maybe just as a follow-up, um, you mentioned obviously a big part of your response or your comments were uh, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, in Russ's forthcoming collection of essays on Catholic social teaching and natural law, uh, which is entitled On the Dignity of Society, uh, he has a wonderful essay on Pachman Terrace, in which he also cites uh, uh, King's letter. And the, one of the points that Russ is making in that, in that very interesting, very, I think very important essay, is that in Pachim and Terrace you have this, uh, this acceptance and let's say this sort of, um, even a kind of promulgation almost of the importance of natural rights or human rights, but always understood as embedded within natural orders. So, and he uses King's example as, as making a very similar point, that you have to have natural rights, but those natural rights have to be understood as embedded within a kind of teleological order an order of the human person towards truth, towards goodness, towards communion with others and God, and in a, a, a teleological order of nature as a whole. And so that the proper home, according to Russ's essay, and according to really, I think it's a good re great reading of Pachman Terrace, is to see these different modes of order and to see human rights or natural rights as embedded and as really founded by those different kinds of teleological orders. And again, he uses King as, as an example of making a very similar argument in that exact letter. And so I think that leads me to the question um, in terms of the future of natural law thinking in one or either or all three of the contexts that we've identified. Uh, what do you see the role, uh, what role do you see teleology playing? This idea of right order or let's say right conduct or even natural rights as being embedded within a kind of teleological order which is natural to the human being and natural to, to nature as a whole. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I actually, think it's crucial. And I think that interpretation of um, Dr. King's remark is right. What I was trying to lift up in my remarks was the rhetorical context of King's remark. Um, and I, I, wanted, I, I do want this distinction between um, justifying a claim and grounding a claim to matter rhetorically and politically. I think one of the things Russ is trying to get at in that um, dialogical context is um, securing agreement across different religious traditions, across different cultural contexts, um, and you know, ap appealing to something like natural law principles in order to do that, or natural law discourses in order to do that. But what, I, what strikes me about King is that though he does that, he, he He's pretty light with the metaphysics, right? Um, is he trained to do that metaphysical work? Not really, sort of. But I'm, I'm trying to give him credit for the um, rhetorical power of the remarks and for the aims that he has as he makes them and treats the grounding relationship rather lightly. Now here's the thing. I mean, so I mean, I do think that philosophers should pay attention to this distinction between justifying and grounding. Uh, I think they they can be teased apart. I think in certain rhetorical settings, uh, under certain um, philosophical probing and questioning, they come together. So in a setting like this, they come together, right? I think in the setting of um, writing a letter to white pastors. In a, in a, you know, from a, from a jail, thinking about the public consumption of his remarks, going light on the metaphysics is really wise. In order to vindicate the, that claim about natural rights, that vindicate his, his, his judgments about the, the grave, horrific injustice of domination and exploitation, he's, he's going to need all the, all the things you mentioned. And, and I'm, and as I say, I don't think his, going light on metaphysics is principled. And I wanted to distinguish him from, you know, I, I, I teach at Princeton Theological Seminary where for, for 50 years the Bartians have ruled the roost. 
and the Bardians are Kantians of one sort or another. And, you know, they, they, they hold firm to Kant's resistance to metaphysics. And so any talk of, you know, natural law, natural knowledge of God, natural orientation of the will to the good, they want to have nothing to do with. And so they, there, there is a Protestant principled rejection of metaphysics. That's not King. But he does go light in certain settings, even though I think in other rhetorical settings, like this one, the one we're having right here, um, he would have to go much heavier. Father, do you want to add anything? You know, just that, you, in a way, it's, it's obvious that, you know, I was speaking from a, a context which doesn't exclude metaphysics yep. and, and, uh, and certainly doesn't exclude uh, a teleological understanding of, of, uh, of ethics. I must say that also that, um, uh, that um, and then there's, there's another issue, you know, uh, the extent to which you can actually bring in, you know, church teaching, ecclesial, ecclesial authority. So that's, that's even, you know, even, you know, even a, a farther, you know, telos, te teleological uh, issue. Thinking about this in, in, the, in the last uh, couple weeks, uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, again, reading a lot of the papers, you know, connected with this, with this uh, conference or, or colloquium, is that, um, uh, in fact, we, you, we can make arguments to the effect, you know, uh, having to do with uh, the application of natural law without resorting to those metaphysical ideas and certainly not, you know, um, or, you know, kind of ecclesi ecclesial authority. But quite frankly, the, the arguments are, are less convincing. So in, in any sort of argument, and again, again this is a, an Aristian idea, is that it, um, you engage with something and, and you have to get them to agree to certain premises. And, and, and so th those are the premises from which you argue. And if you can't get the people to argue from, you know, you know um, to accept certain metaphysical ideas or even uh, theological, ecclesial ideas, your argument's going to be tougher, and and uh, um, and, um, and you know more open to uh, possible objections. That's all, and and so, but yeah, yeah, but sometimes you just have to start there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. No, no, no. Well, in, in in some respects, I mean, I I don't mean to be obtuse, but in some respects, that's the claim that the Protestant deployers of natural law discourse are saying. Oh, yeah. oh. So, in, in other words. For, for some of my Protestant colleagues who care about, um, who want to say that there's something called moral truth mm -hmm. that transcends convention and that want to use um, terms and distinctions they've learned from St. Thomas, they want to be able to do that um, in a kind of metaphysically light way be for the very same reasons, that, 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 that they won't be able to win the argument they want to win oh, or see. make the claims they want to make if they go too, t too deep into the metaphysics, they'll lose their Protestant audience. And, so in and some that's, respects, and that's a, a, a different sort of question. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, there, there are rhetorical yeah. contexts that are quite different. Yeah. Um, the, the two rhetorical contexts have a certain overlap in, in the sense of that they're both deploying natural law terms, but the rhetorical purposes and the kind of persuasive purposes that are at work are, are as you point out, quite, quite different. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, is, I mean, if I can maybe sum up, is, is the argument something like this, that these kinds of metaphysical reflections of grounding moral claims or looking at teleology and the role it has in natural law is most at home, let's say, in the systematic context, in a more contemplative discussion? I, I think context. that's absolutely right. And then when we look at the other two contexts, correct. perhaps what you're saying, yep. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that sounds without right. denying those metaphysical principles, perhaps we pass over them in some kind of reverential So Yeah, yeah so I think that's what's good. So, I mean, one way to think about it is this way. So, look. Um, there's a, there's a form of natural law thinking that begins with principles and, and works down, right? So from the most general and abstract to less so and then down to concrete cases and then to the particulars. Um, you're going to lose a lot of Protestants if you work that way. King understood this. If instead you work with um, moral judgments that are regarded, as King does, as regarded as shared, okay, dominating another person, say in the language of St. Augustine, where you hold another person at your mercy 
and treat them with arbitrary violence. Okay, that's what the language King was using. King thinks everybody can agree that that's bad. He thinks he can secure a certain sort of rhetorical um, room. Yeah, a little sort of room. Okay, <laughs> then. Then, then in some respects, then I want my Catholic brothers and sisters to step in at the right moment and say, okay, you want to say that? Then um, what are the metaphysical commitments you probably need to have in order to vindicate the moral judgments that yeah. um, you're, you're making? So it's, it's working from the bottom up instead of top down. Yeah. Good. Well, um, Michael, shall we? Move into Q and A. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, on uh, John's point, this is the Declaration of Independence. I mean, the most famous sentences on kind of natural law in American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, there is not an argument there. It's it it is mostly rhetorical, although not wrong. It's, it, it, it is not telling a falsity, but it's certainly not a philosophical investigation of different levels of self-evidence. Uh, so I, I, I actually think that in the Western history, it's not just Protestants even, who, who know that in some cases you just have to go straight for what we hold together, what we share, and let's see if there's more philosophy necessary. Yeah, I mean, and I'm also just not, not only thinking about Protestants, but I'm thinking about the rhetorical context that a lot of us occupy who are teaching in higher education right now, right? Where looking for common ground and looking for common hopes is, is what many of us are after, but are, are, are full of despair about finding. Um, my concern, at least with my students in, in, in my academic context, if, if I go quickly to first principles in metaphysics, I lose, I lose half of them. Whereas if I can begin as King does, or as, as you say, as, as, the, as the Declaration does, and look for common agreement on, um, yeah, s some basic senses of what's horrifically unjust, uh, horrifically unjust, for example, and, and the, the, the Declaration of Independence names those as well, that might be a starting point. You know, the, the only thing I would add is, is uh, or just indicate, actually in a way I indicated it, but um, I mean, it's, it's very interesting that, that, uh, that um, Aristotle, upon whom uh, Thomas and so many others, you know, in the Christian Catholic tradition, um, it's, it, it's striking how how much Aristotle speaks about rhetoric. I mean, I mean, I mean, he basically he's the first person to formulate, you know, kind of the rules of the rules of rhetoric, and 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 he's perfectly aware of, of that, you know, that and, and and in fact, I mean, you see it in Plato as well. Is that you know, you ju he just realized that you ha you have to get, you know, a dialogue is about okay, you agree with this, you you get to these principles, and okay, that's going to follow from that. But um, but if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't agree with the principles. It just stops, you know, and uh, so I mean, it's not at all incompatible with what you're saying. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, in, in, is this on? It is on. Yeah, in case someone was wondering who who the first speaker was, that was uh, the man of the hour, Russell Hittinger, who made the comment about the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so, Michael Sherwin, Michael Sherwin, uh, now from the Angelicum in Rome. Uh, John, I was um, hearing you give your three. Uh, categories of Protestant versions of the natural law. I was reminded, I don't know if you've read the book, but George Marsden's book, The Twilight of the American Establishment. And as always, George is very good at dis diagnosing the problem, but I was much less satisfied with his attempt to offer a solution for our contemporary uh, uh, situation, I think basically he was saying we, we should be more civil to each other. And, uh, that didn't seem to get me very far. Uh, but I also was struck by how absent Dr. King was from his analysis. And I'm wondering whether you think that these different versions of natural law could offer a better uh, response that Professor Marsden clearly wants in order to reestablish some type of 
uh, American consensus. Well, from the field, yeah. You're asking a lot. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering what, what you, I mean, have you, have you seen, uh, looking at these versions of Protestant natural law, uh, do they offer resources for uh, what Marsden wants to do at the end of uh, Twilight? So, uh, of the yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm just going to, I'm lifting up my interpretation of King. It's a, a bit irregular, but nevertheless, I, I, I like it. Um, simply because I do think, um, look, to, to get, to get a, a real disagreement going, you've got to have background agreement. And so if, we're, if we're really having moral and political disagreements, then we've got moral and political agreement. Well, we have to figure out what that is. Um, you know, in the, in the paper I wrote for this conference and from other papers I've been writing, you know, I, you know, I think there's, there's and, and you can find this in the founders, you can find this in, in, the, in, the, in the, um, the, the opening to the Constitution. You know, there's, there's a worry about arbitrary power. Um, King has that worry. We should all have that worry. We do all have that worry, says King. Um, you know, if you, if you could find a rhetoric or vocabulary to talk about that, about that particular social ill, domination is the, is the name, but you don't have to use that name. You can, you can, if you can identify examples of one party using the power they have to hold another party at their mercy, right, without any constraint upon, I mean, if you can kind of like identify examples of badness, that we could agree on, maybe there. Maybe there's a foothold. Um, that's why I like the King example. I think my, the, the other two Protestant uses, um, you know, certainly the dogmatic is, is, is basically in, inside Protestant baseball, theologically, right? So I, I, I lifted up basically certain Calvinist reformed theologians who care about divine sovereignty and care about divine rule and find in Thomas's account of law and in the natural and eternal law in particular, the language they need to talk about that better than Calvin. But, but that's not gonna solve our social ills and Mark Marston knows that. You know, as for someone like Vincent Lloyd, um, look, w w what, what Vincent is doing is saying to his fellow African-American progressive intellectuals, hey guys, there's this old-fashioned thing called the natural law that the people you care about, Du Bois, King, others, have deployed and you, don't, you haven't even paid any attention to that. If you would pay attention to that, then maybe some consensus building between, say, the black radical tradition and, um, you know, more conservative Christian, Protestant, and Catholic traditions, that might be interesting. I don't know if those are sources of hope. Um, we're all looking for them, but yeah. John, I have a question. And, and, uh, and it, the question is basically, um, from where did uh, King get this, these ideas? Uh, and let me also, in a, way, in a sense, preface that by saying, um, you know, um, I don't know much about it, but you know, among Catholics, you often hear the, the story or the, the line that, uh, in fact, he actually got this from, from Catholicism. And I mean, this, this is, may, may, may very well be you know, kind of a, the, the typical Catholic uh, in, you know, kind of in tendency to read Catholicism in, into to yeah. where, where it can be read. But, yeah. but what, did he have an education in, in maybe even scholastic uh, philosophy or theology or? You know, he, he did his PhD at BU at okay, Boston University. Yeah. Uh, he studied with the Boston personalists. Okay. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's a Niburian. He's a Reinhold Niebuhr guy. Oh, okay. um, and of course, Niebuhr's an Augustinian. And of course, you can't, you can't hang out with Augustine without somehow sure. eventually hanging out with Thomas. So, you know, he had, uh, a, I, I suspect, and, and here I'm, I'm just speculating, I don't know for certain, but you know, I think he had a, a, a typical Protestant theological education at the master's level, and then, and then so, so too at the doctoral level where he was, sure, exposed to Thomas and Augustine, yeah, okay. but, but mostly probably through Niebuhr. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. But, but so many, I mean, really, you know, when, when he's mentioned, uh, you know, especially that, that, that that speech, you know, yeah. um, 
you know, he's praised for, in fact, you know, holding the Catholic position. At least Catholics are. are exactly. Are, so, in other words, that, but yeah, but so. but I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like how how should we interpret those remarks? Yeah. yeah. And if you look at them carefully, what he's really doing is saying, look, there are moral truths that transcend positive law. Okay. Here's the language to talk about that: eternal and natural law. Okay. okay, okay. Um, he doesn't give us much else. Yeah. Thank you. John Cutterback, Christendom College. Thank you very much for your presentations. So I, I'd be interested to hear what each of you think on the future. Uh, Professor Hittinger referred to uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, empirically, most people did hold those truths to be self-evident. Looking to the future, that's, that's not the case. Th things are moving in the other direction. There's certainly not much to appeal to at the dogmatic level. And I suppose specifically then, particularly dialogically, what is there to appeal to? Will, is the future of natural law more and more just speaking to those who are already in the tribe? Or do you think there really is a future where natural law will be a way to be able to communicate with, dialogue with, people that are holding very different principles? Yeah, I mean, uh, my answer would be coming, would be coming, you know, from my own uh, experience, but um, one thing that I've, I've noticed in Rome, you know, where I teach, uh, and especially at the, at the Angelicum, where uh, Father Michael teaches, is that um, there's just a great, great deal of interest in Thomas Aquinas, and, and, and in particular in, in, in moral issues. And uh, um, that may very well be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a response or, you know, um, response in a sense to, or to the realization that, that, um, that you do need, you know, a good, even metaphysical, you know, basis for these uh, uh, principles which are so challenged nowadays, and uh, so. Um, so, yes, so, uh, I mean, I also teach in a context where there's enormous interest in Aquinas, um, which may come as a surprise. Uh, I, I think it was Fritz Bauerschmidt who wrote five or six years ago that it used to be odd somewhat avant-garde, somewhat edgy for Protestants to read Thomas, so back in the 80s. You know, now it isn't. Um, and that's interesting, that's different. So, you know, I, I teach a seminar on Aquinas every year and, you know, it, 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 there's a waiting list to get in. Um, and, and this is true at, at other Protestant seminaries and divinity schools where Thomas is offered. Okay, so that's, that's new. I, I might add also, I mean, you know, all of my philosophical education has been in, in a, in a non-Catholic, in fact, non-Christian context, but the interest in Aristotle is, is enormous, and, you know, with, you know, kind of uh, virtue theory, et cetera, et cetera, but also metaphysics, logic, et cetera, and, uh, um, and that, um, that makes things easier on me to, to um, when I have to argue with someone who, you know, holds nothing, you know, uh, of the Catholic faith or anything like that, or, or um, because you could really can you know go to to Aristotle and, and Plato, et cetera. You know? Not that I want, but you know I would prefer to go to Thomas because you've got. But, uh, okay. but but let me just say one other thing. I mean, so and I was trying to refer to this before. Um, it kind of depends on the direction of of your reasoning, how it goes. Um, I mean, I, I always think that philosophical theories and, and natural law, in a, in a way, is a kind of theoretical apparatus. They have to have objects. They have to be about something. And, um, you know, one of the things that we want our natural law theories to be about is, um, uh, you know, the, the judgments that human beings make that can be regarded as somehow universal or across, across the species. Um, you know, I think I think the, the the burden on those of us who care about this tradition is to make that that those shared collection of convictions or actions or orientations to the good vivid in such a way that requires the theoretical work. Um, 
that's what I have to do in my context. I've got to make it known to my students, right? These are some shared convictions across human beings, okay? Here's a kind of shared orientation to the human good ac across our species, okay. Now what sort of theoretical apparatus do we need in order to make sense of that? Okay, so that's, that's the kind of invitation. All of these comments are kind of a, a, a elite universities and academic contexts. I mean, I take it, John, that your context was more about the, the ragged shape of our moral and political discourse in this country. And I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Tom Donnelly, and my question's for Father Flannery. So when Aquinas talks about it descending to the defects, um, I think he is saying it's the defect in the formulation not the defect in the natural law, is that it's, it, we encounter, I think Aristotle says, the, the natural law with that aoristos, the measureless measure, right, in application. Uh, and this is Dick Helmholtz's point in his book on natural law in court. It's, it's actually in application we realize what the natural law is, and the example Aquinas has, the other example is where the, the uh, the warriors are going out from the city. That's the, the door. The, right, the gates, and they, yeah, they come yeah. back, and the law is that the gates are to be shut at yeah, sundown. Yeah, yeah. And the realization, and you use this example, Dick, in, in your book, they realize the intent of the legislature was to preserve the city, and therefore you open the gates, notwithstanding the positive law. Um, and so I think Aquinas is pointing in that is that they realize better the natural law in application than they do in the abstract precepts. And I as you say, it's like they have the legislature there, but the divine legislator, uh, not just the mere human one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had, you know, um, I tried to, um, to work on, you know, kind of proving a certain translation of the word defectus that, that he uses. It with, in all the translations, it just comes, when you get down to that level, you got defect. And, but I, I really don't think that, uh, perhaps Father Brock can uh, help me here, but, but I really don't think that, that it, it, you know, the word, at least in that context, has, has the same negative connotation. It's, I, it, he simply means that, that, you know, when you get into certain situations, that law, which is not just, you know, kind of, um, you know, abstract, you know, in most cases it actually applies, but, but in some cases, the defect is it doesn't apply. That's all, that's all it means, you know, that um, it just doesn't hit, you know, and uh, so, but I think that's consistent with what you're saying. Yeah. I hope it is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I wonder whether principles of natural law could be very helpful in controversies in international law. And in particular, China is laying down a normative case to assert control over Taiwan uh, under principles of sovereignty. And so the principle of non-interference means nobody uh, like the United States uh, or Australia should prevent uh, China from taking control of Taiwan. On the other hand, Vattel, in uh, the beginning of his treatise in talking about succession in monarchies, says that the Netherlands was justified in separating from the uh, Habsburg Empire because given what that, how that empire was ruled, the uh, people of Netherlands did not consent to it. So there's an idea of a political community which has a kind of nature that uh, is not the same as a kind of positive law of uh, sovereignty. So, I, uh, but, but the casuistry going on uh, is very important and it, the United States doesn't seem to be, or the uh, Biden administration doesn't seem to be waging the normative uh, battle here. So I wonder whether natural law principles now address to uh, a larger world audience. What, what do people in India think, for example, would be very important. I must say, uh, 
a large part of my family is from Northern Ireland, so it's um, mm. it, it, the question of you know kind of sovereignty. I must say um, I don't want to. I'm scared to even go into that question. I, I I don't know how to apply, you know, natural law principles. Um, I, uh, you know, it's tough. And maybe John, you've got an answer. No, I don't. But, but Russ, do you want to weigh in on this? Probably the greatest modern era of natural law thinking is the New World. Hmm. And it was Dominican and Jesuit. They, they, they immediately faced on yeah, the, yeah. an international level the question of the, the rights and sovereignty of the naturales. Yeah, yeah. Um, David Torres. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it was a great explosion of natural law thinking over yeah. just these kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah. I've just, my point is just that I've never really, I haven't studied it, and, and it, it scares me, it, it bugs me. Yeah, or something. Well, is there another question in the audience? Or if not, I'll pose the final question. So my, this was something we touched on briefly already, but uh, I want to raise the question of the relationship between natural law and human rights or natural rights. And I'll just say that you, know, you could look, and there, there are more than two alternatives, but at least within Catholic thinking, you could identify at least two. One which would be a more kind of Maritanian approach to the issue, which would be, well, we can agree on human rights as a kind of, let's say, rhetorical starting point, and then we can show eventually that the underpinning is natural law. So natural law provides the foundation for human rights, but perhaps we can begin yeah. rhetorically or dialogically with human rights. Now there's another approach from Pierre Menon, which is that no, in fact, natural rights, unnatural law, or sorry, natural rights or human rights understood in our own, let's say, contemporary social imaginary are actually a replacement for, and a kind of a direct replacement for natural law. So if we begin with natural rights or human rights as a kind of dialogical starting point, we're actually completely undercutting the entire natural law foundation. So there's at least these two different approaches to the relationship between natural law and human rights. And so I was just wondering if you might want to, if you could comment on what you think that relationship is or ought to be and how the different contexts might come into play. And we can finish on that with that really light, easy question. Maybe. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's lots to say about this. Um, you know, in, in terms of what actually has happened, Manal might be onto something. Right, so there is a sense in which at the, the certain, the, that the modern um, human rights, natural rights discourse has become dominant in a certain way and people think that they can proceed without appealing to the metaphysical, possible metaphysical foundations of it. Um, I think that's a mistake, um, but nevertheless I think, you know, there's a, there's a kind of historical fact about that. Um, I mean, look, you know, you, many of you have probably read Brian Tierney's book on the origin of, of Wright's talk. You know, I, I find his historical tale convincing. Um, you know, I think the, the, the components of talking about subjective rights, um, natural and, and human or otherwise, um, he, he does a great job of identifying. Um, you know, I think you need a certain equality between parties. Right, I mean, what's, what's if, if you want to claim just treatment from another person, you know, what are your options? You can beg, you can plead, you can manipulate, you can flatter, or you can stand up and claim a right, right? And, and you're not gonna do that unless you think you're authorized to do so. And you know, the social conditions in which you, that enable you to do that are gonna, are gonna have to change. That was, Something that started happening between, in, in monastic orders and between monastics and nobles, says Brian Tierney, and then, and then uh, progressed into the, into the modern period. Um, you know, I, I, I for one don't want to, you know, there's a lot of criticism of, of human rights and of subjective rights discourse. I for one don't want to give up on it, simply because I don't want to give up on that um, capacity of um, persons to regard themselves as rights holder and be able to look those who might oppress them in the eye and say, no, you can't do that. Um, but, you know, I think, I think certainly within the Protestant circles that I live in, um, finding a way to ground those rights claims in something other than themselves is super important. 
and very few people are doing it. Yeah. And what I what I would say is is very similar to what you're said you're saying is that, I mean, we've got this language of rights, which um, didn't exist quite as it does today, like in the 13th century, et cetera, and certainly not you know before, and uh, and it's it's become crazy, you know, and. Uh, but I, I do think that, so if, that's the, the language that we have, and I think it can be grounded in, in uh, you know, a good uh, moral theory, even metaphysics, if you want to go that direction, so, okay. Well, maybe I can just say a last word. Um, I just want to say a thank you to Russ. Again, we're celebrating his work uh, this week with a colloquium, and this, this event, this conversation is a part of that. Uh, Russ, my life has been immeasurably enriched by your teaching, your scholarship, and your friendship, and so I want to say thank you. And on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute, uh, thank you all for joining us here in this room. Thank you who are joining us online. Um, please visit our website to see our upcoming events, including the conference that will be taking place upstairs next week. Uh, featuring uh, Jean-Luc Marion, Remy Brog, Hans Joa, Sarah Coakley, and others. Um, and also please uh, come back to our future programs. We're gonna be having, um, celebrating the, um, we're, we're gonna be celebrating the life of uh, um, Gregor Mendel uh, in November. Otherwise, stick around for reception, those who are in the room, and um, please join me in thanking our discussants for a wonderful conversation today. Thank you.